Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Life. My name is Emmy Klein, and I am your host this evening. And today's episode is a fun kind of mishmash of art supplies. Uh, this is a thing I have been doing ever since I started creating art, just because I am one of those people that, like, whatever I can get my hands on is going to be tossed into one piece. And I add a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Why not? Let's do it. And uh, this is kind of a system of creating that uh, I've just continued along throughout the years and I wanted to share it with you guys. So today's episode is JL247, so if you are interested in anything I am using, make sure to go to the website jerrysartorama.com and type in today's class code, which is JL247. So in the search bar, if you type that in, the teacher's cart should come up and has everything that I'm going to be using. So. Let's jump into this because this is a kind of a mishmash of, like I said, a lot of art supplies are going to go into this one. Uh, everything but the kitchen sink kind of a <laughs> thing. So uh, what I start off with, though, is uh, doing a basic drawing. Now, when it comes to doing a basic drawing, I like to use graphite. Uh, the reason why is because... I mean, we all have pencils lying around at home. I mean, we all grew up using pencils and then, you know, whether or not you graduate to a mechanical pencil or then you go to a pen, uh, any kind of drawing materials will actually work for this first stage. Uh, but my personal favorite is either uh, the graphite pencils or a pen. Uh, now, I, charcoal can get a little bit messy. Now, uh, the paper I like to use is Bristol. Uh, now, the reason why is because I don't want a ton of texture in my paper. Uh, so this is a very super smooth surface uh, to where you're not going to get a whole lot of like bumps and nooks and crannies within that page. So when you're drawing, it's going to remain kind of on the smoother side. So I've already gone ahead and done my drawing. <laughs> uh, now, if you want to really check this out, uh, you guys can see... I did this with graphite. It, it is got that little bit of shiny to it, which is, you know, typical for graphite. Um, but in here, there is absolutely nothing. Um, and this was the, the image that I decided to go with. Now, I'm actually also going to leave this on top of my pad, my, my Soho pad. Uh, the reason why, uh, this is not for any other reason other than uh, this table that I'm working on has a couple of bumps on it. So... If I were to try and do this process on a bumpy table, that texture probably will show through, uh, especially like over here where I think there's some like paint stuck to the table underneath our tablecloth. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing that. If you are working on a surface that is a little bumpy, just put something underneath your page. That way you keep that nice smooth surface. So this whole drawing took me a while. Uh, drawing with a pencil, especially when you're doing it kind of hyper-realistic, is going to take you some time. Now, you do not not have to get to this stage. Uh, you can do an outline. You can do a basic, quick sketch. Uh, this is uh, a full rendering of the bird, which, if you guys want to see my photo reference, it is literally identical. <laughs> I also printed it out in black and white because if you are going to be working in this process uh, and you want to do a full colored rendering of something like this. Um, it does help to print it out in black and white just so you are only focused on the values. So that way you can get your value drawing to where it needs to be. Uh, now when it comes to drawing and sketching with pencils, a couple quick tips with that, um, especially with this process, because pencils come in a variety of different types of lead, um, and for those of you out there who just aren't familiar with that kind of how that works or how that works, uh, there's HB, which is, I would like to call that a, like a zero uh, on a scale of like anything. Uh, that is my, my zero point HB. That is also the lead that is most typically found in any everyday school pencil, the pencils that you get just for, you know, at the store. Uh, when they're not in an art set like this, they tend to be an HB lead. So that's what we're most familiar with. Then it goes B. B is the softer leads. The higher the number, the softer your lead is going to be. And that's why I have it here. It starts with HB, then it goes to B, then 2B, 3B, 4B, and it goes all the way up to 12B. 
Um, now, on the opposite side, it goes H, which is our hard leads. Uh, so I have an H and a 2H, and that is just within this set. Now, when it comes to this specific process, I would not go any softer than a 2B. Now, the reason why is because you want to get your, your darker values because the, the softer leads will give you those darker values, but the softer lead, the more your graphite has a tendency to move when we continue along the process and start adding in uh, our wet kind of materials like uh, the inks and stuff that we're gonna put on top. So I, I tend to not go any higher than a 2B. Now the drawing that I did here, I used a 2B. So I wanted you guys to see exactly how far it can kind of smudge. It's not gonna be a ton um, because I've taken precautions to make sure that it doesn't smudge but I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that if you're gonna do a drawing like this and have it fully rendered, stick to the harder leads. It's gonna help you out in the long run. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to show you uh, is when I use a pencil, we're all used to holding it like this when we're writing, right? When you're drawing with a pencil, do the overhand. You wanna hold it in your palm like this. That way you can use the side of your lead and get more of a soft, kind of an application. That way, unless you have really harsh lines, you can use the, the actual tip of the pencil, but you can see how you can get two different, two very different types of applications with just one pencil. Um, now, you know, of course, the harder you press, the darker your values are gonna be. Uh, if you keep it nice and light, it's gonna be on the lighter side. So, uh, that's just a couple quick things about graphite and the paper. Um, but with this being my drawing and it already being completely done because you guys don't need to sit here for 20 years watching me draw this. That would have taken forever. Actually, I think I started this on an open studio hour. So if you want to actually watch me start this drawing, you can go back and watch that. Uh, but now that it's done, I actually did uh, hit it with a little bit of fixative. Uh, now, I specifically got this one from Sennelier. Uh, this is meant for uh, pencils and charcoal and things like that, the drawing media. Uh, it's just the one I happen to have on hand. There are a ton of different types of fixative. I've also used workable fixative in this. Um, it works really well as well. Like it's, it's a good product to use as well. Um, again, this is a process where I use whatever I have on hand. So if I have this kind of fixative, that's what I'm gonna use. If I have workable fixative, that's what I'm gonna use. And it's all kind of uh, whatever you have is going to work. So that's why I said the same thing with your drawing materials. If you have colored pencils, go for a colored pencil you know, drawing. Um, if you have your graphite, which we mostly all have pencils at home, um, or if you wanna even, I've even done this with a Bic pen. <laughs> That was actually really nice too, because uh, you know with big pens you can actually get some gradients. Um, but I've used this with all types of things. Uh, but graphite again, my favorite. So I have already laid down uh, the fixative, and my pencil is uh, pretty set on the paper. Now, uh, when it comes to the next stage of this process, a um, few things to note is that I'm going to make this into one big wash. I'm going to cover the whole whole page and it's going to take away that really nice crisp white kind of area of my drawing, which again, if you refer back to my reference photo, this is a very high, you know, kind of bright white area. I don't really wanna bring that down too far. Um, so the wash that I'm gonna use is gonna be on the lighter side. I also, when I do put on washes on here, it's going to darken your values a bit. Um, so it's not the end of the world if it's not perfect, but I you know, tend to just do a whole wash over everything. Um, so I'm gonna actually be using acrylic inks uh, just for the first initial wash. I have a couple up here, um, and I again, this is whatever you got on hand it will work. I usually, um, ever since I've been, I think in college, I always have some kind of a brown ink on me. Um, so this one is Antelope Brown by FW. Uh, this is quickly becoming one of my favorites. I just love the color. It has kind of a yellowy tinge to it, but if you have sepia, that works. If you have like a burnt sienna, also works. Uh, if you decide that you don't wanna go brown, that also will be fine. I have the Liquitex uh, Muted Violet, which is fantastic. Uh, now I'm also going to be mixing these two. 
you can mix your acrylic inks no matter if it's in a different brand or not. Um, that's It's totally fine. They work well together. Uh, so I'm going to be mixing that and then doing an entire wash on the whole thing. While I'm getting my, my wash ready, if anybody has any questions uh, that you guys need to throw out, I mean, it's, it's pretty basic so far. Um, let me actually push those up, get them out of the way so you guys can really see what I'm doing. Um, but I am going to, you always got to make sure you mix or like shake up your, your inks like maracas, do a little dance, you know. <laughs> you just want to really make sure that you get uh, the pigment that's kind of settled down at the bottom. You want that kind of evenly dispersed throughout your whole ink. And I always kind of uh, pinch the eyedropper a little bit a couple times just to make sure if there's any ink in that reservoir. It again also mixes in with all the other ink and it all becomes very cohesive. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's do six of each of the antelope brown and the muted violet because this is like one of my favorite colors. So, again, pressing the uh, little stopper just to make sure if there's any additional ink in there. It's also getting nice and mixed. And I'm going to do the same amount. One, two, three, four, five, six. So half and half. And then I'm going to get, I have a bucket of water over here, which is, uh, this is dirty water from what I was doing earlier. Sorry. But this is clean water, which is why I love this brush washing basin, because I always have a little well of clean water. Uh, so I have a pipette, and I'm just going to squeeze in a bunch of water. How much water can you add before you start to affect the integrity of the acrylic ink? Ah, that is a great question. So because we are working on paper, as much as you want. I know when it comes to acrylic inks and having the integrity of the ink, uh, when it's on a kind of a gessoed surface, that's where you need to make sure that that adhesion is no more than 30% water to the ink or even acrylic paint that you have. You don't want to water it down too much. Now, when it comes to paper, because paper is absorbent and has those fibers, even though there's a ton of water in there, that's going to evaporate off and your acrylic polymers might not be really dispersed kind of a thing, but those pigments that are going to be soaked up into your paper, the fibers are going to grab on and so it's still going to be a solid, uh, it's totally fine. Now we have another question? Yeah, going back to sealing your thing with the fixative before yeah. you take the next step, if you did that, could you use oil paint over top of it? When it comes to oil paint on paper, the issue being is that this is not going to be enough of a sealant to give you a solid ground for your paper. Um, this would work if you started off with oil paper. The reason why is because the oils in your, your paints are going to get through this barrier and it's going to start destroying the fibers of your paper. So. With that being said, I would stick with oil paper like Arsh's has their brand. Um, I think, does Stonehenge have one too? I want to say Stonehenge has one as well. There's a couple different brands out there of oil paper, and they are designed to actually accept oil paints. So, we have a What question? if you used a clear primer? A clear primer like a gesso? Mm -hmm. Now, a gesso is a barrier um, that's going to give you a, a nice ground, uh, and you should be able to essentially paint on top of it it's just make sure that your gesso is a solid layer and when it comes to putting clear gesso on top of a pencil drawing because that's the the kind of layering that you would want to do you'd want to put your pencil down first then your gesso the gesso is probably going to move you'd probably want to spray it still before you gesso it because gesso is kind of like the acrylic ink it's going to kind of move your your graphite around uh, but when it comes to clear gesso, it kind of gives it a haze, which is not what I would say is ideal. Um, so if you were to go the other way around and do pencil on top of gesso, gesso is very gritty, so your pencil is going to be kind of eaten away, and you're going to get a lot more graphite down on your paper. 
I, can you guys tell that I've been experimenting with this process for a very long time? So ultimately, um, you, if you wanted to use oil paints, you should use an oil paper. I would say, yeah. The best, the most ideal process with oil paints is going to be used with oil paper. It's not impossible to use Bristol with a gesso combination. You would just probably need to experiment a little bit with that. Uh, just because of the layering and the, the haze that that's going to cause on top of your drawing because that haziness is probably going to lose a lot of those subtle nuances that you get with your pencil drawing um, and that's that's where like you're going to do a lot of work that's going to be covered up and not seen at the end which is a little frustrating. Yes. Okay, my last question. No, you. please. Um, can you also do the same thing with watercolor? Yes, that was the thing. Uh, this is a technique that I've used, and I was going to get into that. Uh, I've used this with everything. I've d used gouache really watered down because gouache tends to be opaque. So if you add a lot of water, it gets a little bit more transparency, and you can put it down on your paper just to kind of tint it a little bit. Uh, you can use watercolor. Um, you can use acrylic paints instead of acrylic inks, and you can water them down because, remember, the fibers of the paper is going to grab on to those acrylic paints. Uh, uh, acrylic polymers and the pigment kind of all in one. So it's going to be archival and you're not going to have an issue with it kind of lifting off and having a, an adhesion issue. So water soluble oils, water soluble oils is still an oil. So it still kind of lands in that category of, I would use oil paper because it still has that water solubility. So you can use water, but it still has the oil in it, and the oil is what destroys the fibers of your paper. So if you use an oil paper that's designed to work with the oils, you're still safe. So that being said, um, I did want to kind of give you also um, a quick rundown of how I, if this is going to be a final illustration for me, like if I were to do this for like a book illustration or a magazine or whatever it may be that I'm being commissioned to do this piece. Before I officially do the actual piece, what I like to do are color studies. So um, this is kind of where I'm going. This is where I want to end up, right? Now to get here, what I do is I scan this final drawing, because this is what I'm working off of, I scan this into my computer and then I scale it down and I print it off. Now I usually kind of mess around with the uh, darkness of my my lines just to kind of see um, what is kind of the most similar to my drawing because this is what I'm working on eventually. So I want it to be very similar. So if you need to up the contrast and or lower it, you know, depending on what you're working with, um, this is a way where you can kind of get a final uh, print off that you can work with. Now this is still Bristol paper. I ran that through my printer, but the printer I used, and this is very important, is a laser printer. I did not use an inkjet printer. The inkjet will bleed and blur, and it's not pretty. Um, so, as you can see, I printed two for one sheet of paper. So, if I start the first one and I'm like, this isn't really working, I will quickly put that off to the side and start a new one. Just to kind of make sure that I know where I'm going, right? And as you can see, once I started adding in my colors, I started making notes. That was kind of key for me to be able to get from here to here and have it look cohesive and have my thoughts and what I want to have happen and have it actually happen on paper. Uh, now, before I work on that one, what I'm going to do is test my wash, right? Because I mixed two colors. Uh, and that's actually, um, this right here, this wash that you're seeing is antelope brown. I did not actually add in the purple for this one. I'm going to have a slightly different look to this, this one that I'm doing here. So what I'm going to do is make sure that my ink is all nice and mixed. I think I didn't mix in the purple. I'm pretty sure I didn't. It's been a minute since I've done that one. Uh, now the other thing to note with Bristol paper as well as when you run it through a printer, I think this is specific to maybe my printer. I don't know if it, it's a thing, uh, but I have noticed this with Bristol as well. When you add a wash or watercolor on top of it, it tends to beat up on the surface. That's okay. It's just the surface of the paper. If you go over it a couple times and kind of work your way into the paper, it's going to actually settle in and go in there. This might've actually been 
similar to the color that I had originally used. Now, this wash right here is a little dark, so if I add a little bit of water by dipping my brush in and just kind of letting it drip in there, I can also use the pipette because that would be faster. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna quickly work just to kind of see how that wash looks. Now, this is pretty good. Now you see, especially where it's printing, it kind of beads up just a little bit. If you go over it a little bit, it'll work its way into the fibers of the paper. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It will only happen for just a, just a second, and then you can kind of work it down and work it in. Now, I'm okay with that. That's a pretty good, I mean, my, my brush is splitting because I'm going really fast and I'm using a lot less water than I wanted to. Um, but I think I actually also make it a little bit lighter. Let's do that. Let's pipette in some more water. Now, the other thing that you can do is also just dab a little over here, you know? Yeah, I think I like that. That's a pretty good wash. So I'm okay with this. Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you, and I'm gonna put this off to the side here. Uh, if you can, actually, let's switch over to that side camera because you can really see it here. You see my paper is bubbling? That's because we just added moisture to this paper. It has not been pre-stretched or anything. Uh, there's a way to fix that. Now, I'm going to hit it with a little bit of a hair dryer. Uh, my, clearly my art hair dryer because it's messy and covered in paint. So as I do this, it's going to start flattening it back out and it'll start curling the edges back up. Now if I get too far where it starts curling up, I can flip it, hit it with a hair dryer, and it'll flatten back out. So let's do that. You see how it's starting to curl up? That's okay, we flip it. And it's relatively flat now. The edges might be a little curled, and it's still a little warm, so it's still kind of cooling off, and I can go back and forth and do this. As many times as I need to. Also, if I really, really, really wanna make sure that this is super flat, I can go put it underneath, like, if I put my, um, my pad of paper down, and then I put a heavy book on top of here and walk away for 24 hours, it's going to flatten it back out. But again, this is just a color study and this one is gonna also do the same thing. But again, if I'm doing this as an illustration or something, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. If I also frame this under glass, you won't be able to tell at all that it's gonna have a little bit of like a bubble. Like it's, it's not gonna be that noticeable. We have a question? Yes, Tuxedo Toe Baby on YouTube asks, so you wouldn't want to just add water to the paint on the paper to make it lighter? I've done that before. Um, the issue being is that I want to make sure that my wash that I have here is, because this is my color study and I'm trying to test out my wash, right? I want to make sure whatever is in here is going to be what I actually end up putting on my final thing. So I'm testing out a wash. It's too dark. I'm going to add water to this before I move on to this one. So I just want to make sure that whatever I put on, because like you can see here um, where I had that first initial darker wash, it already started soaking into the paper. So I want to work fast when I work on my first final or my first wash on the final piece. Um, because if I don't actually work quickly, you're going to get these crazy brush strokes, which can work for you if you want it, but if you're not expecting that and you're fighting with your wash, you're going to have issues. Does that, I hope that makes sense. That makes sense? I hope it makes sense. Yes. Hey, I know that you have done this because mm -hmm. you've done it for me, but um, <laughs> can you talk about how you can print onto watercolor paper? Yes, yes. So it's the same process as printing with um, the Bristol. So I scan uh, these in as like black and white drawings or the, the sketch, the line drawings, whatever it may be that I'm actually sketching in and want to print down. Um, like you guys have seen, I've uh, printed off... Uh, all kinds of different little testers and color study things that I've posted to the Jerry's Life Facebook group. 
um, for you guys to kind of do your own experiments with. Uh, now, the way that I usually do it is whenever I go to send this to <clears throat> the printer, I make sure to adjust the settings to where this is an 11 by 14 paper. Um, so I make sure that my printer is ready for 11 by 14 paper. Uh, then I have to go to my printer and select the correct paper. It has a like side feeding um, like tray. So it knows that this is a specialty paper. Now, if that's all very complicated and printers are very confusing for you, totally fine. Go to a FedEx or Kinko's, be like, hey, here's my paper. Here's the digital file on like a flash drive that I wanna print, or you can usually also email it to them. They're pretty cool about that. Um, and go, I wanna print this onto this paper here. And then they'll just make it happen. As long as you say it needs to be a laser printer, they'll just completely take care of it for you. So, um, and that's whenever I do like the smaller ones, I usually digitally manipulate it to where I place it on an 11 by 14 and all they have to do is open the file and print it. Now, if that again is something that you just don't do and it's not something you're familiar with, they can usually also figure out a way to get that done for you. Um, they might have to charge you a little bit of a fee, but you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, just make sure that uh, when it comes to printing on Bristol, because this is, this is a hundred pounds uh, paper, hundred pound paper, uh, watercolor paper. I've ran a hundred and forty pound through the printer. Three hundred is a little iffy. <laughs> uh, that is where I usually would send it to an actual printer, just because they have the printers that are larger and they can really handle that thick paper. Um, but like an everyday printer, 140 pound watercolor paper or this 100 pound uh, Bristol is totally fine to run it through a printer, usually. It's not a, not a problem. Um, but that is my first initial wash and I, I like this, so I'm gonna go with it. And, you know, I'm, I am gonna light it. I'm gonna lighten it up just slightly because I can always go darker. I can always add in a second wash. It's harder to make it go the other way around. And you'll see, especially here. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I like that lighter version because you can see the darker version and the lighter version. Yes, I like that. So I'm going to say that's a good wash and we're going to go ahead and put it on the big one. So I have my big one inch uh, oval wash brush uh, and I'm going to just soak this whole thing. Now, if you wanted to, you can also tape this down to like a watercolor board. Uh, like a gator board and have it secured onto something. I'm just going to, I didn't actually give myself any edges on this. So I'm just gonna make a mess. So work quickly, that's the name of the game. And you can see if I work quickly and make sure that my edges don't dry, I usually don't get too many streaks. And if I do get streaks, it's okay. Oop, I got some splatter, that's all right. Again, I'm gonna be going over this quite a lot with other things, so if I do get a little bit of a mess, it's all right. Is there a reason you're using this particular size brush and not a larger, wider brush, like say a three or four inch hockey brush? Uh, because I didn't think of it. <laughs> Honestly, uh, yes, you can use a wider brush if you want to, um, or you can, like, it didn't take me very long to just cover that whole thing. That's, it's not, that hard to like really cover it. Um, I just want to make sure that this, there we go. All right, and again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm gonna be going over this in a minute with all kinds of things. Uh, I do want to kind of get that puddle up a little bit there and I'm gonna hit it with the hairdryer to flatten it back down. Because if you see that on the, the side, the side camera here, it's bubbling up. You can see, yeah, right? Again, if it is slightly curling on me, I'm not super worried about it because it will flatten back down, especially if I'm framing it. 
Um, now I will say if you guys are noticing a little couple dots here and there, uh, that is because I was scrubbing the paper with an eraser. <laughs> I did that and I was worried that that was going to happen and it did. Um, so just be aware if you do scrub like your white areas with an eraser, this is a possibility. I am okay with that because I'm going to cover it up with, wherever I put it, white ink. Because remember, this is a really bright area, right, behind the bird. Um, I'm going to actually layer that down with white ink. Now, I'm not going to worry about that um, right now. I can probably do a couple areas to show you guys. Um, but white ink, uh, this one I've been using for a very long time, so it might have actually gotten some water mixed into the bottle. Um, but usually white ink is pretty opaque. Um, so just be aware if you want to kind of use this as almost like a, a whiteout kind of a thing. This is how I do this. Uh, but as you can see, my trees uh, that are kind of blurred and out of focus, uh, those are nice and tinted now. I honestly, when it comes to um, like hitting it with anything, all I do is carve out that area of the white ink and leave that be. I don't actually do anything else with that. It's done. Uh, now the stick also I can do the same thing with. Um, I don't have to do much of anything, but uh, with the actual reference photo, you can see that there's some really pretty greens and things that are kind of in here. Um, and I believe I gave you guys the link to the actual reference photo. So uh, my moderators, my amazing moderators, Frida and Amanda can put that in the chat for you guys. Uh, if I did not give that to you guys, sorry, I will post it to the Jerry's Live Facebook group because I honestly can't remember if I did, sorry. Uh, but I will post this reference photo uh, and uh, the final piece, of course, to our, our Jerry's Live group on Facebook. So if you guys aren't part of that group, make sure you join. It's free to join, just make sure you answer that one security question. All right, so now, now that I have everything nice and toned uh, and I've knocked out, down all of my whites, um, I'm gonna put the inks out of the way over here. I'm not gonna worry about the background just yet. What I'm gonna do is add a little color. So I really like to use colored pencils on this uh, stage. The reason why is because I can get soft variations of color. I can lay down just a little bit here and there, let it kind of peek through, or if I want to actually kind of scrub my pencil into the paper, um, as long as your paper is fully dry, that is kind of key to this whole process because a damp paper is going to kind of pill up on you and you will destroy the paper. Um, but if you do want to actually kind of burnish your colored pencils into that uh, paper, you can and get a nice solid color. Uh, but I'm using the Cezanne 120 color set just because I have it here and I have 120 colors to choose from and it's lovely. Makes me so happy. So uh, as you can see with my reference photo or my reference uh, color study here, I got all my colors that I grabbed and used. So I'm gonna actually just grab the same ones. Here's the 03. So it's the, the one right, way up here that I used in his tummy. Uh, now, as you can see, it's quite dark. And if I were to, uh, and I'm not using a ton of pressure. I am just going to softly add in a little color. and it's almost like tinting it. And this is also why I did the drawing beforehand because it, just drawing like this takes a while, but the variations in things that you can do and get is just so lovely. Like how quickly that makes it look like his tummy is just kind of orange, that orangey red. So pretty. Now I think there's a little bit of yellow over here, so let's grab let's grab a yellow. I don't know if this is the same one I, I used before, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. Amy, um, yes. with the acrylic inks, do you find that there's color shift as it dries? Um it depends on the ink and it depends on the brand. because uh, sometimes it can color shift on you and sometimes it really does not. Um, I will say when it comes to this process, um, these little color studies are wonderful. Now, um, I'm gonna actually just pop this up here because uh, I might have overdone the color studies on some things before, just a little bit. So there's my original drawing. That's just colored pencil. But if you want to just slightly change 
How many of these do I have? I have a ton. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to change the feel of your drawing, this is why the color studies are the best way for me to do it. Because uh, if I decided that that was like, it's too crisp and clean, it's kind of boring, I, I wanted it to have like that antique kind of feel, I can have this and have this as reference. Now, if I decided I want to go like this direction for this um, piece, I can actually make notes of whatever it was that I used in here and I can save that as reference for my next time. Um, now, if I decide that that's too like sepia brown kind of tone and I wanted to punch it up and get a little bit more kind of burnt sienna, like red tones to it, and that was the feel, that works too. Uh, this one right here, oh, sorry, I have, this one is metallic ink. You can see the, the mica flake is like reflecting in there. I uh, Hopefully you can, pretty sure you can. Uh, now, this is, I wanted to show you guys this uh, because I burnished the background around it with a white pencil. It did not obviously make it super, super bright and white because it's a colored pencil and to get it back down to a really bright white, you're gonna probably need to either use something or pick like an ink or gouache uh, and to kind of erase it back out. Now, I just wanted to show you this because that white pencil, because I burnished it, kind of toned down the mica flake uh, and it kind of really kind of covered it up. So down here is just uh, raw mica flake with the, the, the ink, but I just wanted to quickly show you. You can also use uh, metallic inks as well. We have a question? Yes, Neha on YouTube asks, what do you think of the Derwent Chromaflow colored pencils? Could we use those instead? And I don't think we've done a Jerry's Live on those. I don't think we have. Um, I've used all types of colored pencils for this process. I've used water-soluble pencils. I've used the, the Derwent pencils. I've used Prismacolor. I've used uh, the Cezanne. I've, this, again, this is the process where I use whatever I have around me. And it's literally like, I need to make something, so I grab this and I grab that and I grab this and I grab that, and then it all kind of just comes together for this. So I always start off with a, a basic black and white drawing. I seal the whole thing in with my acrylic ink wash. Uh, so even though I did use fixative to kind of make sure that my graphite doesn't like move too much, um, I really, really seal it in with that, that acrylic wash. That's why I like using the acrylic wash. It also knocks down all of those values and takes away that really bright white. It's almost like toning your canvas, but your drawing's already done. It's already there. So all you have to do is just kind of color it now. So how you want to choose to color it is the, the next really fun step. Uh, this right here is a banana scented highlighter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right? You can also use highlighters with this. I don't think it I don't think it smells like banana anymore. Those those scented highlighters usually fade pretty quick. But I mean how bright is that color? And again, I went from this and just coated the whole thing in highlighter and then just very lightly layered on those colors. And then I started building up that crazy red, those greens, and as long as you have colored pencils that have a good amount of pigment in them you are good to go. But I use whatever I have on hand. Yes. Um, with it being the acrylic ink and you watered it down, mm -hmm. um, if I were to go over it with like water soluble pencils, would I be able to activate them and not mess with the background? Yes. Okay. So because that's why I use the acrylic ink as my tonal wash is because it's still acrylic. Once it's dry, it is permanent and it seals your drawing in. This is like my, my toned, this is kind of like almost like what I would think of as like a toned gesso surface. So whatever I put on top of it, nothing underneath is gonna move. So if you use a water soluble pencil, if you decide that you wanna go on top of this with watercolors, you can still do that. It's still going to accept media. If I decided that I wanted to continue along with the washes and you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take my wash the same wash that I had initially, and I decided that I wanted, um, let's do these leaves. This leaves up here, I wanted to make them a little bit darker and a little bit more of that wash. This is why I have a smaller brush, right? If I wanted to, I also could have just left all of that brighter white areas completely alone and only tinted the areas that I needed to. This is where this, 
I, I, I'm probably not gonna finish this entire piece on camera here. I'm only trying to inspire you to grab whatever you have around you and see what it does. Because there's a lot of different ways that you can use this material and layer them, right? So if I decided I wanted to darken that up, I just darkened that leaf, right? If I decided that this shadow is not dark enough on his tummy, and I wanted just, just, just a little darker, I can do that too, right? If I decided that I wanted that more purple, I can go in with a purple ink. I can then go in with a purple watercolor or uh, the purple colored pencil. This is such a versatile process, right? So, as you can see, I have a lot of little mushrooms, uh, but then I also had like one like here where I used a dark blue ink and it got way dark and it almost obliterated my drawing to the point where I, I had a hard time seeing it. So what I did is I just took a white ink and I carved back out around it. So now it's like a little spot illustration, right? You can very easily take this, put it in a book and you know, there's a spot illustration for a little children's you know, book or something. Uh, then you can also start playing around with how you apply the ink. It doesn't have to be the full wash. It could just be a circle. It could be a blended circle where the edges kind of fade off. Um, that was actually, I will say, this was my original drawing. This is actually still print now that I think about it. But you can see I did not actually uh, seal this in with the fixative. I used a 2H pencil with this so the, the pencil itself did not move very much with the ink but I wanted to make sure to do all the other ones. So you can also start splattering. But again, I haven't, with all of these, I have not started adding in colors. I was just playing with only the ink wash, and that was the very first stage, right? So there's a lot of ways that you can do this process and make it fit your art, which is really fun and really cool. All my mushroom fell away. So um, now, I can continue along with this. Let me grab, this one looks good. Again, I'm not actually looking at the colors that I had used before, but let me pop in a couple of blues here just to kind of show you guys. Because the, the darker colors like blues, they will also start darkening the values, which is why when I did my initial drawing, I didn't actually get the like the darkest dark values like where his eye is where it's almost like pitch black and I did get that really really dark on my drawing but like over here in his wings I did not go that dark on that I didn't go that dark on his stomach because I knew I was going to be layering in colors so I wanted to make sure to kind of combat that and and be able to do that now if I were to take a brighter blue like say this one and layer that on top I can add in the blue and it won't darken it as much. And it still gives me that kind of blue tone that's really soft and subtle. And you see the areas that I did not actually add in a ton of the graphite are now a much brighter blue, right? How cute is that? Look at a little burb. Now, how are we doing on time? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. I told you, I'm not gonna be able to finish this. This is just inspiration for you guys to go out and do all kinds of different uh, art with your stuff that you have on hand. You know, anything will work of what you have. But I did wanna show you a couple different examples of things that can happen. Now, this is where I was testing out different papers. Um, I just grabbed a couple different kinds. Um, and a couple different types of pencil. Uh, this is a jumbo jet. This is a pit pencil, which is the, the graphite that is not shiny. Uh, and then I had a mechanical pencil on me. Uh, so I was just doing quick little sketches. Now let's actually go to the side camera because I think you're gonna see the texture of this paper really, really well. Um, so hopefully you can see that, but within each drawing, because this is the, the Soho canvas paper, um, this is, extremely textured. It's got a very specific texture and so I don't like this. You might love it. It might be something that you you work on and it's just like it makes you happy. 
Uh, this is just me being able to show you that you can test out different papers and scrap pieces that you have lying around. Uh, now this is watercolor paper. As you can see, far more textured. This is actually not hot press, this is cold press watercolor paper. So same exact uh, uh, tools that I use, the, the mechanical pencil, this is the jumbo jet, this is the pit pencil. So I also did not spray them. I was using the white ink, there's the antelope brown wash, and just to kind of see what would happen. Uh, it definitely smudged quite a bit more with the charcoal. I just need to be aware of that, right? And maybe this texture works for you. Maybe you want to do a portrait and this is what you're looking for, you know? Uh, this, I'm actually kind of slowly tilt that. This is, again, the same exact pencils, same exact wash. This is the Yes canvas. So this is uh, from the pad that I had, um, that we, we have on the website, and this is Yes Canvas, so this is a canvas that will accept all media. You could go in and do oil paints on top of this because this is canvas. Uh, it's not paper, and it's it going to accept those oils really well. Uh, so this would be another option for those people looking for oils. Uh, this is the Bristol. So I can see, like, it was super smooth. I loved how it looked. I loved how it, it kind of worked with the washes and I even popped in some blue. Just that was the ink as well. So you can see like you can use a combination of uh, washes, the drawing and you know all, all kinds of different things on top of it just to kind of play and experiment. Um, but you don't have to stick to pencil like I said. You can also use ink. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this. This was from my ink show. So this, these were the, uh, the squid. <laughs> these were the little squid guys that I drew uh, when we were talking about different techniques for inking. Um, so I wanted to quickly do a wash on top of this. Why not? I also don't remember what kind of the ink I used. Do you guys remember? Uh, I do not, but the okay. Yes canvas that you were showing there a minute ago, was that from a roll or a pad? Or? It was from a pad. So it is a canvas pad, uh, which means you get the canvas, it's not stretched, it's just in like, almost like a pad of paper, right? And it, it just, you tear out a sheet and then move on with your day. It's, it's really, really great. I love that for practice. Um, so as you can see, I just quickly toned that down and this is giving me one of those like super old timey kind of nautical vibes. All I needed was a tone of, of wash, uh, ink wash. Let me hit it with a hairdryer. Also side note, this uh, paper that I'm using is watercolor paper. So if you don't have bristle, you can use watercolor paper. This is a hot press though, so it doesn't have a whole lot of texture. Maybe I want, we're going to give them a little bit of like a pink, pink tinge. I've got a request on YouTube to see the white ink. The white ink, yes. I do want to actually get to the white ink. Thank you for asking for that. This is still a little damp. Should have waited. Again, I'm not pressing very hard when I'm just tinting it, but like... Just a slight tint, and he has a slight color to him, you know? All right, so let's do the white ink. I'm gonna need a different ceramic well for that. The ink that you used for the squid video was the Golden Panda Blackest China Ink in a three and a half ounce bottle. Right, thank you for looking that up, Frida. So, let me also get my pencils out of the way. So, white ink. White ink is a very, very heavy pigment. You need to shake. Shaky, shaky. Like maracas. Sorry. You really, really have to make sure you shake. Uh, one thing I do usually is, I because you're shaking it, I usually end up with bubbles in there, and I can, if I can see it floating around the bottom, then I know that there's no extra pigment stuck to the bottom because I can see the bubbles. I don't know if anybody else does that or if it's just me. Yes. Um, Clover in YouTube is asking, what about using the acrylic wash over an acrylic painting to tint it, say with a yes. sunset glow? 
Uh, now that is going to work really well, absolutely. Just be aware, uh, if you are working on canvas, you're gonna need to make sure that you water down your acrylic inks with an acrylic polymer, like a medium. Uh, a, if you're gonna try and water it down to like a fluid consistency like I'm doing with this, um, an airbrush medium would be really, really great because then you still get that adhesion, um, but you're not gonna have a really thick acrylic, you know? Um, the other thing to note is transparency of your acrylics. So this white ink is pretty opaque. Um, where is it? Does this have, uh, where is, aha, uh -huh. on the um, bottle here, there is a little square, half of it's full. It's got a little like half black, half white square on that. That is your uh, transparency. Hopefully the glare is not too bad. <laughs> this is the Angelo Brown. It is semi-transparent or semi-opaque um, with Liquitex. They all, yep, here we go. It has an empty square and it's transparent. It says it right next to it. Now I will say this one right here is all dark. So that means it is very opaque. It also has an O in brackets next to it. So usually every brand is gonna have it labeled somewhere. Um, there was another ink that I was looking at and one of them had like a T or um, an O as well but they should be labeled as to where, whether or not they're transparent or opaque. So if you're trying to get a nice light glaze to where you can see things through it, transparency is going to help you so much. So let's get this white ink. I'm just gonna get a good amount of white ink. Now, because I want the opacity of this white ink, um, hopefully this is not super wet. Where's my easy wiper? You guys know I have the easies on the show. I don't have to, but love them. All right, so if anybody's wondering what an easy wiper is, just a cotton rag, white cotton rag. Um, I use them instead of paper towels. So I am going to make sure that my brush is nice and clean and I have just, just ink. There's no water in here, yes. Melissa on YouTube asks, I want to add a shaker ball to some of my ink bottles. What can I use as the shaker ball? A lot of the acrylic inks come with the little yeah. metal balls in them, I think. But if you don't have a shaker ball to use, what is it, like a ball bearing? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah, a ball bearing. If you go to like a hardware store, you might be able to get just, just the ball bearing. Um, the other thing that I have done is uh, like if I have a, a nail polish that I don't like, <laughs> I will steal them from my nail polish. I just, you got to make sure that it's really, really clean. Um before you put it in your acrylic paints. All right, yeah. Sorry, painting and talking is hard. So as you can see, it's not incredibly super, let me kind of shift this over a little bit. Uh, it's not completely obliterating it back to completely white. Uh, it's still, I'm putting it on in thin, thin layers. Now you can build that up and you can actually kind of get some variations, which is really pretty. And you can get some areas that are really, really bright white. You can get some areas that are a little less so. Um, but when it comes to like over here by the tree that I am, it's, it's kind of blurred out. I'm not giving it a super crisp line. Whereas right here, I would make sure it is absolutely following the line of that tree branch. How would a zinc white acrylic paint blend with, say, a cad orange acrylic ink? That depends on your paints. Uh, all right, so when it comes to zinc white, zinc white is a transparent white. So it's not, it doesn't have that opacity like a titanium white would. Uh, when it comes to cadmium, we're talking about a, a true cadmium, I would assume, I'm guessing. Um, because if, you, if it's a cadmium hue, it can be a combination of pigments that I don't know what it's going to do, you know? Um, the issue being is that manufacturers can call any color anything they want. Um, it's the pigment codes that are really going to make a difference. So if you're, it, it's all going to be in an experimentation. And again, if you need to, 
uh, do a little color study, you know? Figure it out over here. It's okay, you don't have to have the final piece done before you know what that's gonna do. And that's also but a good I just... way to test with mixing your mediums like an acrylic mm -hmm. ink and, a, and an acrylic paint since they do have different binders and viscosities and things like that. Now, acrylic ink and acrylic paints should still be pigment with an acrylic, mol uh, acrylic polymer. So they should still work well together. Um, it just, it, it depends on what you get. If you can find out whether or not it's a, like an acrylic ink, like an acrylic paint that's just been thinned down with an additional binder that's something else, that's, that's where it kind of, you never know. Uh, but for the most part, acrylics, whether it's an ink or a paint, it should just be an acrylic polymer with pigment. So they should work well together. And yes, I have done that before. Uh, this is also a really fun process to do in your sketchbook. Just be aware that your pages are going to get a little funky. Which I actually love. Because then I can find out what page I'm on really easily. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be like, oh, I'm, I stopped there. I see I it. I hadn't thought about that, but that is a really good way to tell. Who needs a bookmark? See? It's, again, it's not completely pure white, but it just brings it down just a little bit. Um, and like over here where I have a little bit of like a leaf that's, again, blurred out. And like it's not actually, I think I did it over here. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but like I went over the whole thing with white. And then I went over the whole thing again for a second coat, but I didn't go over that little leaf area. So like I kind of left it, but it's really subtle. Whether or not you can see it, I don't know, but I can see it and it makes me happy, right? Now, how are we doing on time? Cause I know we're probably getting kind of close. Three minutes. Three minutes, all right. So if you guys do have additional questions with this, you know, please pop them in the chats now. Um, if you are watching this in the future and we are no longer live, pop it in the chat. I will always keep an eye on, um, you know, our videos and make sure that if you guys have a question, I answer it. You can also make sure you go into um, the Facebook, the Jerry's Live Facebook group. And then if you want to, you can also find my Jerry's Live, my Facebook page, which is Emmy, host of Jerry's Live. And if you want to send me a message and have you know, all the questions of whatever it is that you're working on specifically, send me pictures, anything, and get advice, absolutely. You can talk to me directly there. Um, I am happy to help. I love seeing your guys' artwork. If you do any of this kind of a mixed media where, you know, you're using whatever you got on hand and this inspired you, please post it. Make sure you tag, use the hashtag uh, JL247. That way I can find it too. Whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, any of those. I look. And I love seeing it. It makes me so happy. But yeah, look. Little leaf. It's very subtle. But it's there. Uh, but this is how I'm going to approach it. And again, I would probably go back over these areas with an additional layer. And kind of build it up that way. Um, again, with these over here, I'm not trying to get straight to the edge and make it be a harsh line. I'm kind of feathering it out with my brush, really light touches when it comes to that, just to kind of indicate that there is an edge, but it's not a harsh, harsh edge. This right here, because this is in the foreground, that's why it's so crisp. So you really want to make sure you pay attention to your hard lines, soft lines, and you know continue that throughout the application of all the different colors and things that you want to use on here. So. That, I think, is good. I'm going to let that white be. And yes, I am definitely going to finish this. Absolutely. This is a fantastic process for uh, all kinds of different methods. Like, um, if you want to do portraiture, this is a fantastic way of coloring it as well. Um, again, if you're going to be doing a portrait, uh, make sure you use a big, <laughs> really big brush to get that kind of really perfect gradient down. Um, to where it would also have a very similar kind of effect like this where it's all one big wash and not as streaky as I had gotten on here, sorry. So I'm using a smaller brush. Uh, now also, 
in case you were wondering. You don't have to do this with animals. You can do this with character design. I, ha I almost forgot to show you guys. I also had a little landscape here, but I had a little character over here and I wanted to show you my bad milk. How cute is he? I'm gonna hold him up. His bad milk. Why did I draw bad milk, you might ask? Frida. She is the one to blame for this one. I asked her what kind of character I should draw and she said milk, so bad milk. And there you go. I'm gonna kinda do the same thing for my landscape, because that also works really well for landscape. Hit it with a hair dryer. So for these guys, let me grab, we're going to have to quickly add in a little bit of color for them. Because Bad Milk, why, why, I don't know, but I feel like he needs a black eye. He's bad. So we just need a little bit of purple. Maybe he's just really tired. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm going to take that purple. Also give them a little bit of shadow, ground them. Give them a little bit of shadow here. Consistency. And you know what? I'm gonna take a bright red. For the milk, which I wrote like a child because I was doing it really fast. Feel like it adds to it, you know. <laughs> There's my bad milk, <laughs> and that's I mean, super super fast. I can take that white ink again and kind of carve it out. I can continue on with the, the colors and add it in, but. Let's real fast show you guys how to uh, add in a little bit of color for this landscape so we don't do just a goofy little character. Let's do this olivey green. Which is going to be reflected down in the water. Again, I'm using the same kind of technique overhand for when I'm applying that colored pencil added to the trees. All right, land. let's add a little bit. You know what? Let's make it a little bit more autumn. Maybe I want an autumn scene. We'll do a little bit more orange. This right here was um, a scene from the park nearby us, uh, Umstead Park. Just doing a quick little hike out there, so. I Make definitely it. thought it was Shelly Lake. It it would Pretty almost be Shelly Lake, yeah. Lakes around here all look the same. Let's add, you know what, let's add a little bit more of this darker green, just for these shadowy areas. It's a little bit more blue, so it'll push my landscape back in the distance. Fastest landscape I've ever done. Let's add an, a blue sky. Let's do blue sky. I feel like it needs that. Right? Maybe I want, yeah, now this will work. And even though I have that funky, you know, toned down, it still reads as like a blue sky. Pretend like that's a cloud. We're gonna give it a cloud. A happy little cloud. <laughs> Reflect it down here too. And I'm gonna also lighten that just a bit with my white. Hopefully my white is clean. 
kind of burnish it in a little bit too. Give a little blendy blend. So I'm actually adding a lot more pressure on this than I was with the other layers. There we go. Fastest landscape ever. And it's tiny. Also, if you were wondering how I got Soho in such a tiny little form, boop. <laughs> it's, it's a tiny little Soho. I did uh, just add these to the teacher's card as well. So it is a sample pack, which I do love. Uh, and you get all of these fun little Soho samples. So you got the canvas paper, which I did use and I'm showing you guys over there. There's tracing paper, sketch paper, marker paper, and the Bristol. So if you guys want to give this paper a try, uh, these are really great as well. But that's how I was getting all my tiny little illustrations. <laughs> but I think last call for questions. I think we're good. Um, again, if I did miss any of your questions, pop them in the uh, comment area below. I will make sure to check them. And that was the show, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it inspiring and you get to just go grab whatever you have, even that art supply that you've been holding on to that you're like, I need to do something special with it. No, just go use it, even just a little bit, you know? Don't make it as precious as it, you know, doesn't need to be. We need to use our art supplies and use them to make a big arty mess and, you know, experiment with them. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see your artwork and make sure you join me next week because I'm going to have a guest on the show. It's going to be Andrew Cook. He's coming back and we're going to be going over all types of fun things. Uh, Fabriano Artistico and all kinds of additional things on top of that. He's got, a, he's got a lot of things. I'm very excited. I can see all the supplies over there and I'm stoked. So make sure you join me then and I will see you later. Bye.